Well, good afternoon. It's such a lovely day to be outside. I'm, I'm pleased that we get so many people that have come on inside for this. I'm Bob Wilhelm. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I'm really pleased to welcome many of you back to campus uh, for, for the reunion, for the Centennial, Centennial College reunion. I think this uh, lecture, we really hope that it will give you a, an additional point of connection uh, to the Centennial Education Program uh, that was created to celebrate the university's centennial in 1969. So here we are, 50 years later, It's uh, with another celebration this year. The Centennial Education Program was surely a very forward-thinking program. Uh, that brought together all aspects of university life, both educational, residential, social. And I'm pleased to be here with you today to honor this chapter in UNL's history. As part of the university's 150th celebration this year, so 50 more years, uh, UNL has been focusing what is a, generally a two lecture series a year, the, the Nebraska Lecture Series. We've been focusing on the university's history, and the impact on the state, but we're doing it every month. So we have one a month, and uh, we're really pleased that we could have one that was focused on the Centennial College. These lectures are aimed at uniting the, university's, uh, the university community with a greater community in Lincoln uh, and beyond to, to celebrate intellectual life at UNL and also to highlight excellence in research and creative activity. The lecture series is sponsored by the UNL Research Council, which is a, a very significant uh, enterprise for faculty, uh, but also in co cooperation with the Office of the Chancellor, the Office of the Research and Economic Development, and also the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute that we all know as OLLI. And I don't know, do we have some people from OLLI here today? All right, well, here we go. I'll give a little handout for that. Great. We're also recording this and we're, we're live streaming. So we, we likely have some people who are joining us on the live web stream uh, and also through Fed, Facebook Live. So we're, we're happy that they're here with us today. So uh, as well, we've had a number of very significant sponsors to make this this 12 lecture series for the year. Uh, the Human, uh, Humanities uh, Nebraska and, the, and its executive director, Chris Summerick, have sponsored this year's lectures, as they often do. And we also uh, are very appreciative of the National Endowment of the Humanities, who has provided additional funding, which has allowed us to both expand this lecture series, uh, but also to, uh, to capture these uh, in podcasts or video casts, uh, which are available for people to see later. And we, we think this is gonna be very interesting both in terms of serving more people, but also uh, from a historical standpoint, people, people will be able to look back on this uh, in years beyond. Uh, I, I especially want to recognize the University's Research Council. I talked about this a little bit before, but uh, we have faculty from across the campus from many different disciplines uh, that work with us, and they select the ne Nebraska Lecture Series speakers. Uh, and it's one of the most, that's the highest recognition that the council bestows on faculty. Um, so we're really pleased that they can work with us on this. Uh, after the, the lecture today, we're gonna have some time for question and, and answer. And uh, Rodrigo Franco Cruz here, associate professor in the School of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences will be moderating a question and answer session. So we'll have plenty of time to discuss and to I hear more from the panel as we go along. But I also want to tell you, I know I expect all of you are going to be here for, for the whole thing here today, but, but still, in case you're wondering, there's a prize at the end. So you really want to hang on for the prize. Uh, we're, we're going to be doing a random selection for the audience members uh, for, to receive a, a copy of the book that we published this year to celebrate the 150 years of the University of Nebraska, Dear Old Nebraska U. Uh, so you have to be here to win. And so I'll be here at the end uh, to work on that. So now with uh, covering all of the different uh, details here today and, and all, and again, I'm really pleased that you're with us here. 
Uh, I want to turn the presentation over to Allie Moeller, a UNL faculty member who taught at the Centennial College, and she's going to introduce the panel. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, Allie. To I just remembered it's been 50 years. I just want you to know I was a teenager at the time. <laughs> um, I have the distinct honor today of introducing three individuals, icons really, not only in the institution of the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, but people that have left indelible imprints on our minds and on our hearts. Um, I'd like to begin with Professor Barbara Lee Smith. She was a faculty member in political science here and was also on the faculty in Centennial College 1976-77 and became a senior fellow uh, from 1977 um, to 1979. Um, she's also a member of the faculty and native cases project director at Evergreen State College where she was the provost as well. Um, next to her is Professor Paul Olson. He was a fellow from 77-79. Actually, he joined Centennial College at the request of Nelson Potter, who was really worried about Centennial's longevity. And he taught groups of um, groups working on black roots, Jewish and Christian virgins, versions of Genesis and how to work on social change. Um, next to me is Professor Ned Hedges. Uh, Ned is a native of Nebraska, Central he wanted me to mention that he's from Central City High School. Um, <laughs> and he is a professor in the English department where his specialization was children's literature. Uh, at the time of Centennial College, he was an administrator, uh, assistant vice chancellor of academic affairs. Um, one of the proudest moments he states that he had was that he received the Sorensen Distinguished Teaching Award as well as the James A. Lake Academic Freedom Award. These three individuals have three very different experiences uh, with Centennial College and represent aspects from the administrative side, the academic side, and from the side of looking at from the outside as well. Um, we're tying this particular panel entitled Navigating Change, Creativity, and Community to the uh, N150 project. As you heard yesterday uh, with the wonderful talk by Elizabeth Knoll and then followed up by Anna Helzer, who conducted research last summer looking at the uh, really researching Centennial College through the archives and interviewing 14 individuals about their experience and then comparing that to the aspirations of N150. And what she found essentially was a 100% overlap in their missions and their goals. And I think we're gonna hear more about that. So I'm gonna begin with asking Paul to talk a little bit about Robert Knowles' dream to create a community of scholars, as he called it, a community of an interdisciplinary group of students and faculty that is not limited to a specific curriculum, but rather more interdisciplinary in nature. So Paul, you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, let's see. I better get a mic done. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I remember in 1967, we were uh, celebrating uh, some anniversary of the university's existence um, about two years before Centennial was founded. And uh, we had some national people come in and talk about how, what a good university would be like. And I remember Robert getting up and being very upset about what the university was doing in terms of its failure to address uh, the contemporary situation. Um, Vietnam was in full gear then, and uh, uh, the women's movement was in full gear, as was uh, Black Rebellion. Um, and he was saying nothing that the, that the university is doing has uh, a relevance to the most urgent issues of the time, or to our students' most urgent issues. Um, and uh, I knew, I had known Robert since uh, 1951. Um, he was my mentor, a uh, master student here at Nebraska. Um, and I knew that he had an interest in um, residential learning, community learning. And uh, somehow, uh, across the years from 67 to 69, he put together the resources 
with the help of Ned and the help of other people within the university and willing faculty members, uh, the Centennial College vision. Now, <clears throat> the Centennial College was founded, as I understood it, to study, at least in its first years, social change, to study and act on social change. And I came into Centennial College almost 10 years after it was founded. And it, I came from a commission that I had headed for the federal government on exactly that theme, a commission on undergraduate education, the education of teachers that looked at institutions uh, nationwide and how they could produce teachers that would respond to and develop constructive social change. And so I was happy to accept uh, uh, the appointment to the Centennial College. So I was busy with the Great Plains Center and lots of other things and wasn't very focused. But I was grateful for the honor. Um, and when I got to the Centennial College, what I realized that Centennial College in 1977 had ceased to be a major agent of social change. Uh, at least I thought that. I tried to teach uh, small group sessions on strategies that one might use uh, to, for, to foment social change. And I got two students out of the um, several dozen students that existed there. And uh, one of them was Kent Waltermuth, who writes the, the movie uh, uh, reviews for the uh, Journal Star. And one other one was a young student who wanted to work on hydroponic agriculture. Um, concerning which I knew nothing. <coughs> and uh, he didn't know anything either, pretty obviously. <laughs> so um, I've learned today that there are many other aspects of social change and desirable social change that were being developed even then in 77, 79, and Barbara can probably talk about these. There were people that were working on Indian issues, people that were working on black issues, people that were working on uh, special education and the uh, mainstreaming issues, etc. I'm sure there was a, a lot going on that I didn't recognize. But so far as I could understand, there was not much. And the college as a whole did not sense its unity around trying to change the world of our country or of our state. And I think partly that has to do with um, what had happened with the Kent State Uprising. The Centennial College, more than any other sector of the university, was blamed by the populace at large, wrongly, I think, but blamed for the occupation of the ROTC building and the demonstrations that took place after that, connected with rebellion against the murders at Kent State and uh, the, the repression that accompanied the Vietnam War. Now, we should have been proud of that. We should have been proud of what happened in the occupation of the ROTC building, students putting, to get, putting into, into, into action their insights with respect to how social change takes place and what it takes to change the culture of a country. Um, <clears throat> but uh, a head of an institution had been fired, faculty members had been, uh, had been pushed out, faculty members had been fired, and there was a, there, we were playing in a minor key by 1977 to 79. Now, <clears throat> this is not to say that important things weren't going on, but I think we, this illustrates what I've been talking about, illustrates if we're talking about what should happen in the future, it illustrates that the university, if it undertakes seriously to ask people to do what the N-150 document does, that is to learn, to carry what they learn into action within the community, to develop a community of learning that acts on the culture. That's a very dangerous uh, vocation for a university. It has to recognize that vocation and the dangers that are implicit in it. And it has to <coughs> develop uh, documents and codicils that suggest both what faculty responsibilities are and what their limits are in those situations and what student responsibilities and limits are. Otherwise, we're going to, otherwise it's just going to be a nominal gesture or otherwise it's going to uh, lead to chaos within the faculty and within the student body. I think there are important changes having to do with 
social responsibility and social change that could be undertaken in the future. I think uh, climate change, climate disruption is one of those. I think another one of those is the growth of populism and the development of, of uh, dictatorial regimes around the world, including in this country. And uh, finally, the, the uh, growth and, uh, and uh, lack of control over the nuclear industry in this country and around the world, I think is a, those are th at least three themes that I can think of. But I think that uh, the university in the N-150 document is undertaking a charge that is far more, uh, uh, far more dynamite than it recognizes. And I hope it does recognize that and undertakes to develop the, the tools to handle what it uh, says it wants to swallow. I think uh, Paul really hit upon one of the big aims of Centennial College, which was really to bring education into the community, to connect the college to the community. And one of the examples that we um, talked about yesterday was the example with our former mayor, Don Wesley, who, with a research team, decided to investigate uh, whether a second nuclear plant was going to be necessary to put at Fort Calhoun. Some of you may remember that. There was one already. So they'd spent, what, a good part of a year really doing the research, putting a research report together to the legislature, and that research was followed and there was not a second nuclear plant installed. So it's that kind of, that kind of social change that happens by making learning authentic and real and extending it into the community. So Barbara, um, your, your existence and uh, beyond Centennial College was really focused on community-based education. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Okay. I came to Centennial without much background in uh, alternative education, uh, but I learned a lot from being here and went on to other uh, institutions where that was a central agenda. So I'm very thankful for my two years here in terms of the learning that went on. So one of the things that I'm most proud of that we did when I was senior fellow is we got funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities to do an artist in residence program. And the idea there was to actually make that a partnership with the community. And we tried to make those projects projects about social change and underrepresented populations. So that was very successful. Uh, we had a mime who was an artist. They lived in the dorm as well with the students. We had a guitar, classical guitar expert. And Ned was one of the few people who came to that uh, performance, which was in an enormous auditorium. Do you remember that? <laughs> Two of the most popular um, artists in residence were uh, a painter, a landscape painter. We've got some of his work um, on pictures that I think maybe are available here. And the most revolutionary of them actually was a, a mural artist from Chicago, Mark Rogovin, and he studied under the great Mexican mural artists. And he involved the students in creating four mural projects in the community. One was at the maximum security prison, where the uh, inmates created a very large mural. I think it was four or five panels, like as long as that whole wall, um, of their life. And the first couple weeks of that were very rough. The guards heckled them. They said they never finish projects. They're just bums. They're not going to do anything. But the inmates persevered. And they produced an amazing mural that was on portable panels and toured the state the next year. Um, they also produced a mural um, in a nursing home. That was a shadow mural where the uh, people in the nursing home in their wheelchairs or with their walkers or standing were against a wall with the lights dimmed and shadows cast on the wall and then the painting is done around the image. They did a mural, uh, shadow mural of the Centennial students as well. And they did another one in an elementary school which was uh, in a neighborhood that was mainly uh, Hispanic at the time. And I still remember going there and watching them doing it and um, 
it was a generational thing. There were young, young artists, budding artists, and there was uh, their grandparents. And they had a really lively debate about whether Cesar Chavez or the Virgin Mary should be bigger. <laughs> so uh, that, that, uh, that project showed me a whole bunch of things about how you can raise money around innovative projects, about how you can actually build partnerships fairly easily. We had five community partners for that project. They eagerly embraced us reaching out to them and helped fund it and support it. Um, and just the value of students working with communities. And I think community-based learning is a really needed direction, probably at UNL as well as most other places. And some of the most interesting schools actually now uh, make that almost a requirement of, uh, of their graduates. This happens in lots of departments, like journalism, <laughs> kind of as a part of the, the uh, instruction, but that isn't true across the board. And I think that's an untapped opportunity that isn't very expensive and is rich in learning. So I guess the other thing I want to say about what was going on in higher ed um, at that time nationally, the period from 68 till about 75 was a decade of turmoil, growth, um, change and uh, Centennial and the University of Nebraska were not alone in what was going on. A recent report that I saw said that there were 50 Centennial experiments around the United States, mostly at research universities, and some of them are in the Knoll report. Um, and within four years, about half were gone. So these are hard things to keep going in research universities, but they they used a common format, uh, and they had a huge impact. And we can see that on you. I mean, the people in the audience who went through this, uh, it was life-changing for 2,000 students that lasted 12 years. That's a long time. We think it could last longer, though, and you can build on that. This was also a time of great success in expanding the higher ed system. This was the system, this was when the community college system doubled and it was building on the baby boom and the expansion of the system as a whole. And there's huge untapped resources around partnerships between institutions, between campuses and online options that, that can happen. Um, it takes more effort to do that. But in my state, Washington, half the population now starts in a community college. So if, uh, if you really want to get to anywhere near 100% of the population, you've got to have partnerships. And we also have a program called Running Start that combines this junior and senior year in high school with the first two years of college, which lowers the cost of education 50%. So there's some really interesting things out there, I think. Um, that can be done, and so it's a fabulous time to open your minds and really look at the landscape uh, as, an, as an institutional system. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Centennial College really had an impact on all of you on me, on a lot of the faculty, as well as the students. But it also had its share of challenges, and which eventually then, of course, led to what we would call its demise. Um, and so Ned is going to address that for us and talk a little bit about his role as an administrator. He was, of course, as you all know, a big supporter of Centennial College um, and had the honor, non-honor, of having to make the decision to really um, let Centennial College go its own way. Thank you, Allie. <clears throat> I was never in Centennial. I was only around Centennial. I helped Robert start the whole thing in, in, a, in a very simple kind of way. I had been a director of freshman English. We had had uh, some classes in dormitories. We had had some experience with residential education. Um, I learned all about how to deal with residence halls and how to deal with registrars and how to deal with curriculum committees 
and how to deal with all of that other stuff. In other words, I was very good at administrivia. <coughs> and Robert was not. <laughs> Robert had no interest in it. Uh, and so I was able to help him deal with a whole bunch of that kind of stuff that it's necessary to get something like this going. And then I became assistant director of, or, or assistant uh, vice chancellor for academic affairs. And in those days, the directors of various things, like the director of athletics of the museum and the art gallery and the centennial senior fellow reported to the assistant vice chancellor and the deans reported to the vice chancellor. Uh, and so I was the direct administrative supervisor of the Centennial Program in the early days. And then I became vice chancellor, and at that time then I was one place separated from it. But as uh, Ali said, I <coughs> also had the, uh, the darkest day of my administration was when I got to stand before the Board of Regents and recommend the dissolution of the Centennial Education Program. And I'll explain how that occurred in a few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> but the Centennial Program was, you know, it was a dream. It was a dream to create a community of scholars. And it, Robert Knoll was the, was the person who was able to get that all done. But of course, it was not done in a vacuum. Uh, there were people within the institution, particularly in the English department, particularly people like Dudley Bailey and Paul Olson, uh, who had had visions of changing the entire pedagogical structure of higher education. When I was a beginning graduate student, uh, almost all education in those days was the professor reigned, the students sat and listened, the students responded by regurgitating material on, in papers and examinations. And it wasn't until about this time when this new generation of Turks came along, uh, who began to engage students in discussion and in, in, in listen to students. Uh, and it was that germ of what was going on that created the Centennial Program. <clears throat> and the f I listened to people the last couple of days in this, in this uh, reunion, and it's pretty clear that the the most effective part of the Centennial Program was the combination of the residential focus of having people living together so that education continued outside of the walls of the classroom in interpersonal relationships forever and the association with faculty members and the students together as a community. Uh, <clears throat> Daniel Brooks said yesterday, that when he came to the university as a, a freshman student in the Centennial Program, it didn't really change him so much in terms of uh, causing changes in his attitudes toward society and social change and social structure. The most important thing for him was it gave him permission to talk to a faculty member. And I've heard that the last couple of days over and over again from these people who came back. The, the big, big difference for them in the Centennial Program is to be associated with faculty members on an individual and continuing basis, and to have their ideas challenged. Robert used to talk about <coughs> the purpose of education was to tease the students out of thought. <laughs> and the unexamined life is not worth living. Science. And <laughs> I'll never, I'll, I'll always remember <laughs> last night Elizabeth talking about the family dinner in those days when Robert was under some stress and in her teenage <clears throat> revolutionary stage said one evening, do we always have to talk about bread as being interesting. <laughs> and I thought we'll probably, probably respond in saying, the unexamined bread is not worth eating. I've, I've heard his <laughs> expressions repeated from, from you all so, so many times. The first few years of the Centennial Program were an explosion 
of creativity and excitement on the campus. It is, it is testimony to those first few years of Centennial living up to its expectation that most of the people here at this reunion are from those first two or three years of the Centennial program. There was an excitement. There was uh, the excitement of creativity among the faculty members as well as the students. Um, and it gradually, I think, faded. My own opinion, this is, may not be true, my own opinion is that the biggest change that occurred over the years was the gradual reduction of the residential feature of the program. And more and more and more of the students did not live there. They just came on a part-time basis. And they, were not, they did not experience that full out-of-classroom experience. Now, I want, to, I want to talk a little bit about the closing of the program. Uh, there seems to be a perception at times that, that, the, the, that the administration of the university discontinued the Centennial program because it was too liberal. And it was, it was not rigorous, it was too liberal, it was, it was a, a political embarrassment to the institution and the Board of Regents and the legislature and the administration and all these people decided that, that, that it should go away. But I have to tell you, I was never at one time, as Vice Chancellor, approached by anybody from the Board of Regents or the legislature or the public at large or the administration to tell me, you've got to get rid of those commies out of the institution. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the, the problems we were having all during that period of time, from my first meeting as Assistant Vice Chancellor, when I discovered that we were faced with a $927,000 shortfall in tuition income and what to do about it, I told my wife <clears throat> when I went home that day, I wasn't used to those kinds of numbers. I said, I felt so bad. If I had a million dollars, I would have given it to them. <clears throat> but we went through a 10-year period of continually dealing with those kinds uh, of things. And so we had to figure out ways to reallocate resources within the institution, to try to find sort resources that we could provide for those areas that needed the most to be built up to areas of excellence by taking it away from programs that already existed if it was possible. And so we created a very elaborate system through our bylaws, insisting upon primary faculty participation in program evaluation and, and development through a, a committee called the Academic Planning Committee to make decisions about these sorts of things. And so in 1981, the final, the, the, the final process, uh, our Academic Planning Committee determined that among those things that we could cut from the university that would least negatively affect the basic core of the institution. Among those was the Centennial Education Program. We wouldn't have to fire any faculty members. It was a sort of appendage of the institution that could be eliminated. But the only reason to do that was so that we could take the resources that were freed up to use those resources to reallocate to some other part of the institution. It was not a matter of saying the, the Centennial Program is bad. Let's get rid of it. The issue was, can we more profitably use those resources for other purposes? Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, what Centennial College was. Basically, one of the big things was to counter student isolation. Because in a large Research One institution, which is also, we have a bifurcation of mission, it's also a land-grant institution, 25 to 26,000 students. And the freshman experience typically is having lectures of 100 to 200 students. Um, is can be very isolating, especially 
when we draw a population from a large rural area in Nebraska. And um, I had the occasion recently to meet with a group of freshmen um, to interview them just as a preparation for this panel to say, so what was your experience thus far? And I had six of them in a kind of a focus group um, arena and asked them uh, exactly what are the things that they're really um, learning what are the things that are going to make them come back? And I was interrupted right away by two students who said, well, I'm not coming back. And I said, why is that? He says, well, I don't know anyone on this campus. I don't know my peers. I'm in classes with over 100 students. I don't have, I don't know how to approach any of my faculty. And I think what you've heard here is exactly those things. That ability to take that risk to speak to a professor takes a lot of confidence that our typical freshmen do not have. And so what are some of the things the university is doing now to overcome that? We're doing a lot of communities, learning communities, uh, where folks are living together uh, and by discipline at times and other times interdisciplinary focus. Uh, we have a variety of um, outlets for kids to try to do that, but of course we can do more. And the idea behind this panel, too, is to take a look at the research that, uh, that Anna Helzer did on her UCARE grant this summer. Take a look at her questions were, what are the lessons that we can learn from Centennial Education that can inform uh, UNL and most certainly uh, the N150 report? Because as I mentioned earlier, the aspirations exactly paralleled what the aims were of Centennial College. So I'm going to ask the panel to address that topic. What are some of those things that you think need to happen that really worked well for Centennial and some suggestions that you might have for UNL to learn from our experience at Centennial College? Me first? Sure. OK. Well, my observation over the years of things that really, really happened that made a difference in terms of the instruction, particularly of undergraduate students, came from individual people. Bob Fuller from the Department of Physics. That, well, first I guess I should start out with the, we had a faculty club. The faculty club was a place where faculty met for lunch, mm -hmm. basically, at round tables. And so you were eating lunch with people from other disciplines. You met people that you did not know. And you, you encountered problems between physics and English and art and so on. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It was a great, great way to develop relationships, if you will, a community of scholars within, within the university. Vern Williams was a young man who was a uh, educational psychology professor and he had thought that we needed to do something to improve the instruction for freshman students improve the freshman experience and so he gathered together a group of us I was the director of freshman English Bob Fuller was in charge of the in freshman program in physics Mel Thornton was in charge of the freshman program in mathematics uh, Walt Bruning was in charge of the freshman program in chemistry. Um, who else? There were a couple of other people. And we, we met every Friday at the, at the, at the uh, faculty club, primarily because they had very, very good clam chowder on Fridays. <laughs> and so we organized ourselves and we called ourselves the Chowder and Harpsichord Marching Band Society. <laughs> and our purpose was to pool our ideas among us about how to improve the freshman experience at the University of Nebraska. And that was a long time ago. That was even before the Centennial Program. And so, and Bob Fuller ended up, some of you may know, and maybe you don't, as, as one of the great, great innovators of the improvement of education at this university for many, many years. And, and Mel Thornton and, and, uh, and the other guys were very active in these sorts of things that, pr that produced things like the Centennial Program. And so my advice to the university for the next 
50 years is to find those people. It's not the programs that you have to develop. What you have to do is find and identify those people who are going to develop those programs. You have to find the Robert Knowles, the Paul Olsons, the Bob Fullers, perhaps the Ned Hedges, I don't know. There might be an administrator somewhere among them. <clears throat> Encourage them, develop them, and reward them for those kinds of, a, of developments rather than simply research. Okay, that's my, and I know that those people, I don't know who they are, but I know they exist. They are here. They are on this campus right now. Find them, encourage them, develop them. Thank you. I think Paul is going to say that. I, I think we uh, need to recognize what's happened to the university. I, I first came to the University of Nebraska in 1949 as a summer school student. And I was here as a master's student from 51 to 53 and came back and was continuously a faculty member from 57. Um, when I first came to the university, it had 5,100 students. When we had the Montgomery lectureships, practically every faculty member would come to the Montgomery lectureships and the, the, the uh, topic of discussion for the next several days among most faculty members would be the content of the uh, Montgomery lectureships. That we had a faculty club, but we, we had, uh, there were <laughs> numerous um, arenas through which the faculty spoke to one another, and also some arenas through which the, fa the students spoke to each other. Um, what's happened to higher education is that it's no longer, in any serious sense, a community of learners. It's a community of publishers. Um, uh, uh, publication becomes a career like the career of O.K. Bowden would be impossible. He was the first locked lecturer at, at, at Oxford and uh, probably one of the half dozen most distinguished uh, philosophers that the United States has produced. He, <coughs> he didn't publish anything until he was damn near 60 years old. Uh, and his first uh, book was published after he, or about the time he retired from the university. Yet he produced, a com he had surrounding him a, commu a discursive community of people who were committed to the kind of philosophy he was doing. And he didn't care about publication. He didn't care about anything but finding the truth, finding meaning for his own life. And until we see that education is not a means but an end, when we, when we begin to relate to our students, as Buber says, in an I-thou relationship rather than an I-it relationship, we're not going to be a good university. The creation of the centen the genius of Centennial was the creation of a community. By the time I had come to Centennial, that community factor had declined somewhat because the students weren't living together. But <clears throat> I, I think higher education, and not just higher education in this country, my, I have two sons who are professors, and they both complain about the anonymity of the students the reliance on externalized uh, measuring tools, uh, the uh, automaton character of the learning that takes place, and the meaningless of the learning that's, that's undertaken. And I think until we begin to address those problems, uh, no, nothing else will matter. I think find the faculty is a good place to start, and I don't think it would be that hard to do it because You've got spies. In other words, you've got people in all the different places, the library, the departments. They know who the fabulous teachers are. You already give awards to f great teachers. Do you use them? That's what, I, that's what I think is really wrong, is that we, we aren't locating the arenas where the people are and creating arenas to leverage their excellence and their mentoring to other people. Now, at the University of Washington, they had a Center for Instructional Development and Research, sometimes called the Teaching and Learning Center, but it was called the Center for Instructional Development and Research because it's a research university, way up on the top. This was where TAs were taught to teach. Really aggressive, innovative departments like, like English and um, sociology uh, developed their own teaching 
centers and protocols and training programs for their TAs. And that produces the next generation of fantastic uh, teachers. Now you use the old doogies like this guy to help you run those things, not do the grunt work, but be, share the practice. And they feel honored at the same time. So um, I think you've got to invest in faculty development and faculty um, arenas of change and re-education. And you're not going to get the you know people that are diehards, I don't want to do that, because sometimes they're just too shy, actually, to even admit that. But you will get a whole lot of people, I think, who are hungry for uh, intellectual discussion, for mentorship, for friendship, because institutions can be um, very uh, alienating, especially as newcomers. So a really solid new faculty orientation program needs to be put in place, too, that's at least a year long, that gives people a buddy system, that radiates the message that you're a teacher, too, and there's really fabulous ways to become a better teacher. Um, so I think that's one thing you can do. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, University of Washington, in one of its uh, budget-cutting enterprises, got rid of CIDR, the Center for Instructional Development and Research. Really stupid, in my opinion. That's really under-investing in your future and in the health of your community. There have been several paradigm shifts that have really occurred as we look back at, at the last 50 years, one of which is, uh, in my opinion, not looking at the whole person developing the more personal, uh, the more personal socialization of the, of the individual, but the emphasis has been more on job skills, and college is being seen more as a place where we want to prepare someone to make lots of money. Um, and as you can see that with the enrollment, if you look at arts and science, you remember at commencement when arts and science had like two thirds of the main floor of the Coliseum? Well, it's now the business college. Um, and those kinds of shifts have happened. Another shift that has really happened is uh, there's a book, um, Bowling Alone. I don't know how many of you have read it, but it, there's been a shift. No one wants to be bowling in a league and commit to a Tuesday night. They want to bowl alone. And when that happens, according to the author, democracy begins to suffer because when you do things solo, you lose the community. And he talks about the Italian city-states, for example, that had choirs, that had soccer teams. They maintained the democracy. But those that did not, they began to dissipate from within. So the whole theme, really, of relationships, building community, having a sense of connection, belonging, how do we bring that back? And I think we've tried. I know that uh, Vice Chancellor Wilhelm is sponsors a faculty, what do we call it, a faculty forum on, uh, it's a, oh, oh, there we go, a faculty connector, which is we meet uh, twice a month um, at the mill for a socialization. Um, there are attempts being made, but I think there's been a shift in faculty, people working at home. They're not coming to the office. I can, okay, here we go. This is a old curmudgeon. <laughs> if you go outside right now and watch the students walking down the sidewalk around the cabinet, every one of them is walking along looking at a cell phone. It's like this. And they, are are. Not, they are not talking to one another. They're, Texting. This summer I was out in Colorado, my, one of my grandsons is a new musician. I a little pride here. He's the band leader for Casey Musgraves, if you've ever heard of Casey Musgraves. And we were at a, out there to go to a concert at Red Rocks, and, and we were sitting at, at, at a, 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 a sort of almost hippie-like bar uh, having lunch. And, and we noticed a couple sitting at a table a few tables away, young people, a couple boy and girl, and they were sitting there, and they were both lo looking at their telephones. Going like, and I said to Kyle, I said, who are they talking to? <laughs> and he said, probably each other. 
And I said, really? He said, now watch. The young man would sit there and his thumbs were going like that. <laughs> he was going to stop. And then the girl would be looking there, her thumbs would be going like this. And then pretty soon the boy would, her thumb, you know, they obviously were talking to one another on their telephones <laughs> rather than, and now that is a challenge <laughs> within the university in the future that people are going to have to figure out how to deal with. People simply do not communicate in the same way. That doesn't mean they don't communicate. It's not in the same way. And uh, that's going to be, that, that's something, you know, all these people with all, that, there's lots and lots of intelligence and creativity in a university. They can figure it out, but it's a problem. Paul? I, I have a story um, that I was told a couple of weeks ago. And it, I think it's germane to, the, to our discussion. Um, both Simone de Beauvoir, the great feminist, and Simone Weil, the great uh, Jewish Christian thinker, were students together at the normal school in Paris. And someone came up to the two of them, I guess, as they were walking together and said, uh, uh, which would be the more terrible, to be hungry or to have no sense of meaning in your life? And uh, Simone de Beauvoir said right away to have to live a meaningless life. And uh, Simone Weil said, oh, well, you obviously have never been hungry. <laughs> now, I think there's a profound truth there. That is, that, and it's a truth that the universities are responding to, that is, that uh, we may not live by bread alone, but we start with bread. And the fact that we start with bread has meant that the only thing we care about is bread. That is, we don't ask the question, what are you living for? Walden begins where I live and what I live for. And <coughs> one of the you know, significant sentences uh, in, that, uh, in that chapter is, most of mankind live lives of quiet desperation. I think that most of our students either live lives of quiet desperation or are so numbed by the bureaucratic procedures through which they're going that they don't even recognize their desperation. And I think what we have to ask in communities the question of what, what is the meaning of your life and why are you living and what are you trying to get done? Until that question is asked, education is altogether meaningless. Slight change of direction here. I mean, what I do now is I start to ask, well, have, has the 150 group looked actually at enrollment data and retention data? Um, the national dropout rate in the first year of college is 43%. If you move that even 5%, that solves your tuition problem. Um, <laughs> And it isn't that the students are just, you know, maladroits that can't cut it. A lot of it is what happens in the first two weeks. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is about smaller classes. <laughs> so I like the, the way that some universities are using learning communities to change the factual structure of the courses to build smaller classes and more contact. So they do it by linking two classes, so co-enroll, they just have taken all the classes off the general ed list, which is way too long to process anyway, and they link a small class, um, all, a skill class usually, the English camp classes, everyone knows those can be smaller, to a, to a slightly bigger class. And so if it's poli-sci with an enrollment of 50 and the English is, is 25, half of the ones in the poli-sci class are also in the English, the English draws on the content for the essays of, of the poli-sci class. So those students get a double dose of each other. They're together twice as long. Um, and you can do that with speech, and you can do it with diversity classes, or you could do it with a whole bunch of stuff that actually relates to each other. And when it's really successful, the teachers are starting to actually talk together. <laughs> but you can do it without even talking together. So that's a really inexpensive way to do it. At the University of Oregon, where this started, they're called FIGs, Freshman Interest Groups. 
they linked half of their gen ed freshman classes to, um, to another course. And some are major kind of things. It's like you ask the health department or the um, different specialties, what's a good link? And they usually pick English because it's required or speech or something like that. Or they're a thematic thing, like the nature of human nature. Um, UW did the same thing and they mainstreamed their tech courses when that first got going that way and community-based learning courses. Mm -hmm. So there's really good ways to do this inexpensively, but it takes some organizing, you know, to make that happen. So I really think you need not just a bunch of fabulous teachers together, but a brain trust of people who can think that way and look, look around you, around the country, at what's, what's happening and cut, track, track that freshman rate and you'll see it go down because you can change it. You really can. Well, Barbara, I remember you telling me about Portland State, and they have a contract, I believe, an ongoing contract with 10 organizations in the community. Yeah. They have a community-based community, community -based learning requirement now at, for all students. And um, it's a course that's four credits plus an internship. And uh, they have a bunch of internships that change uh, time to time. And then they have ongoing contracts with a few organizations where they funnel cohorts of students to. The uh, State Historical Society is one of those that they have an ongoing relationship with. And that really serves that organization very, very well. And Michael Farrell was telling me this morning that he had that kind of a cooperation with the School of Journalism and NET where they took 10 um, interns there who actually got hands-on kind of experience there and that went on for 10 years and again one of the problems then became the change in administration, right? That's another issue that of course is one that can't be ignored. One of the things that I heard this morning that really impacted me was what Fran Kay said about the difference between credentialing and teaching. And one of the things that we found through the research that we did this summer is that students really welcome the opportunity to learn from failure and to face ambiguity without fear. And I think uh, that kind of speaks to what Fran was talking out about as well. I mean, to me, it would seem like in the freshman experience, there would be an opportunity where they maybe take something pass-fail for six hours, where they can explore things that she called were way be she, she said it radically, meaning everyone should try to get a D in something. I'm not sure I w I'm in favor of that particularly, <laughs> but the opportunity to take a course that challenges you that's not going to kill your GPA. Uh, that really allows you to stretch. And I remember, uh, I didn't even know what philosophy was when I started as a freshman. I, that's not something we did at Central High School in Omaha, Nebraska. And I remember thinking all these abstract, I, mean, I was a concrete pre-med kind of person. I couldn't really fathom what this was, and I ended up majoring in it because it was beyond me, okay? But the philosophy professor realized this is someone who has zero knowledge about what philosophy is and took some time to give me some special readings. I think we need to encourage our students to take that risk, to jump off and give, have the opportunity to really be able to take something beyond their ability. I, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I, in connection with credentialism, um, if you look at the uh, requirements, that is the course requirements or the testing requirements for, for most professions, the, the professional law, teachers, et cetera, et cetera, there is zero validation for those tests. That is, there's zero correlation between the tests and performance within the vocation. So students are being directed to acquire skills that have no relationship to, their, to the vocations into which they're going. There are numerous lawsuits that have established that this is the case. The second thing is, that's also true, at least, and I don't know, I haven't studied the data within the last two or three years, but the ACT and the SAT were not predictive of student performance in higher education, so that this 
kind of empty test, empty hurdles, meaningless hurdles, I should say, the imposition of meaningless hurdles as the meaning that students are supposed to take away from their, t from their school and, and higher education experience. That imposition is an imposition, imposition which is socially ordained and absolutely destructive. I think they d you do need to have teachers who can t you can talk to about it, and you need um, you need to have facilities on the campus where they can go learn more about. I didn't even know anything after graduating from a liberal arts college about the future when I was a senior. So I applied to law school, to the foreign service, and to graduate school, and. Uh, and an insurance company. <laughs> I think we're going and I almost did a random choice about, you know, which of those I did, but that now I think many colleges have more support services for that. And they also need a lot more guidance through financial uh, opportunities because they just don't know. Um, but I think it's partly a political issue. I mean, we have one former Catholic college, Heritage University, that's what used to be run by the nuns and is now a, a private college, but they capped their enrollment uh, tuition price at a third of what the state publics are charging. And our new online system, Washington Governor's University, which is actually very good, did the same thing. So price matters in this state there is one other uh, cluster college program in this state that my husband taught in at UNO, the Goodrich program, established at the same time. It's thriving still. But you know why? Permanent faculty, permanent leadership, it's focused on African Americans, a real population with documented needs, four-year scholarships. Permanent budget. Yep. <laughs> I can't, I only wanted to make a comment that I can't outcome. I, I, I cannot relate to that experience. I was born in 1933. There were very few people born in 1933 if people knew how to prevent it. We were in the depths of the depression. You couldn't afford kids. So all the, I was in the smallest high school class in, in history in my school. All of my life, every place I have gone, every step of my career, there is a tremendous shortage of people. Yeah. So I had every opportunity. When I got my PhD, we sat down, my wife and I sat down with a map of the United States, and we picked out, where do you think we would like to live? And I, and I wrote letters of, of, of application or for, for jobs, you know, to send a, my resume to 20 schools. I got 19 positive responses. I got 13 job offers. Today, students send out 200 applications, they get no responses. And the one response I got was the best I've ever received from anybody. It was from a young, from a, he, he wasn't young, he was a friend of a, of a friend of mine. He was the chair of the of a Department of English at the University of Oregon. His name was Kester Svensson. And the response I got was a one sentence response. So dear Mr. Hedges, I'm sorry to tell you that we do not have a position available for a person with your qualifications. <laughs> and you can take it either way you want to. I think we're going to go ahead and move to the question and answer period here. And Professor Cruz. Um, yes. Uh, well, let's thank our panelists uh, for, for the nice presentation. And uh, we, have, we have already transitioned to the question and answer. Please uh, use the microphone because just to remind you, we are live streaming this uh, uh, today's uh, talk. So any questions from the audience? Raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. In our preparation of thinking about this in the first panel this morning, we talked about some of the 
innovative programs that are addressing issues. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to what's there to build upon. Because I know, um, Dr. Moeller, you've been thinking about this and some of, of the ways that you can bring back the spirit of Centennial. Thanks. One of the ways that I've talked to the Patrice McMahon, who is now the new director of the Honors College, and I brought back, um, I taught a course called Improving Children's Life Chances for the Honors College, where I put students, honors students, into the community at centers like Wix and Friendship Home and the very lowest income elementary schools to really see a side of life that they hadn't necessarily experienced. And um, it was a hit. It was always the most early subscribed seminar. So I called her up and I said, you know, this is what made Centennial so great. We, it made learning real. We were out in the schools. It's like learning a language. Learning it in the classroom is, is stilted. Communicating with someone and exchanging ideas is real when you meet them in a real situation. So she said, I'm excited about this. So she and I are going to meet, and she's already done quite a bit of this community-based research, uh, research and teaming and internships. So we're planning to expand this. I'm very excited. I'm going to take an active role in that to expand learning for students in the Honors College to work in the community to really connect learning to our, an authentic setting. So that's exciting. Some of that's already being done, obviously, but we're going to make that a priority for the Honors College. It's another question over there. So I've heard so many really useful insights into what prompted the Centennial College, what made it work, especially in the early days. Um, surely, the insights that we've heard should be made available to a much larger, larger audience. So I'm, I'm wondering, could you, could you somehow pull this together and perhaps bring in thoughts from educators from across the country to kind of put forward a centennial statement, something that would say, here's our problem, here's how we looked at it in 1969, Here's what we did that seemed to work. Here were things that confused it, conflicted with it, challenged it. But here are the enduring values that we think we need to put forward. People living together, people studying together, community of scholars, faculty partnering with students in the scholarship process, community involvement. Those are the themes that I've heard and I would, I can't imagine that it would not be a very powerful um, published piece. And I think it would help the rest of us as we go forward in our own domains to say, oh, I see faculty leaders right, but nevertheless faculty leaders that are approachable, people like Bob Knoll. I, I think we'd learn from that experience and it would go beyond, it would help propagate the centennial message to a much larger audience. I would really challenge you to do that. Well, actually, we're in, on the, in process of doing exactly that. Anna, this was Anna's project uh, that she did with the UCARE. So she and I thought, taught, thought about writing an article. And I've been giving that some thought since uh, yesterday, since I heard all these inspiring testimonials. And I think what would really be good is for me to reach out together with Anna to some of these folks that have spoken and to put a piece into Change Magazine, which is a, a journal that really speaks to leaders in the field, business, education. So that's one of the plans. So if you hear from me, don't say no. <laughs> Other questions here? I'm not going to question, but I've got some thoughts to throw out and see if you think these are bad ideas or good ideas. One, um, this question of students being fearful when they come in, I've experienced that with the teaching that I've been doing the past few years, and, and I've, I've had kids come out in my classes. I've had kids uh, tell me that they're thinking about suicide. I've had kids that express a, a, a tremendous degree of self-doubt and this seems to be a growing phenomenon and I've also noticed that the university tends to want to push its older faculty to the side and I'm wondering if there is not some way that you can take 
the older generation who are the people that some of the people that Ned Hedges is talking about here that you need to find to make something happen and find ways to couple them with the students who are maybe in the most need of having some kind of friendship beyond a peer group that texts each other across the table instead of gazing into each other's eyes, which is what we did when I was a kid. So that's one thought. Then another thought is, uh, this is something we've been trying to put together in our time-lapse project. I would like to create a fund to uh, do what I call apprenticeships. And this is on the order of uh, the old Renaissance uh, Ette uh, idea that you, you come in as a, a low-class uh, sketcher and then eventually you get to put paint on canvas and then eventually become a master or whatever. The apprentice would be someone who has finished their undergraduate degree but doesn't know what they want to do next for sure or finish their graduate program and is not ready to move on to a doctorate program and would like some real world experience and if is there a way that we can find funding to create opportunities to work in the real world as a bridge between either one academic experience and another or one academic experience and a full-fledged job. And there's a way you can do that at the university if you hire people as part-timers. You can keep them on for two years without having to advertise the job. So there's ways to make this work economically by twisting the system up and using it for other purposes than other which it was designed. And so it would solve a couple of problems. It helps the students figure out what's next, and it keeps them in the state long enough that maybe we can get a little salt on their tails and they won't leave. Because one of the questions that people in the state have is, why am I paying all this tax money when you're educating students that want to move to Chicago or Los Angeles or New York? Is my tax money being used outside of the state after these kids get educated? So those are a few things to think about. Yeah. I, I have a question? I have a question, but do you have an answer? Okay, I have another question. It's not particularly related to that. Um, we see, I think, a dichotomy now. Um, math and sciences and business, and then the arts and sciences. And there's almost a divide in between that the one doesn't think that the other is necessary. And I see that um, in the high schools and middle schools as well. And yet anybody doing research needs to write it up. Anybody doing math needs to be able to communicate that math. And so how do we bridge that gap? How can we find a way, and this is directed to the panel, how can we find a way for, for something like Centennial to, to bridge the gap between, because we see this, I see a huge divide. I, I, I think it's there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't have any real answers. I like your ideas, by the way. I think they're good. But I'd have to ask you back, where do you take these ideas? Uh, there needs to be some administrative place that can lead fundraising, idea gathering, idea deciding. So uh, you've got a vice chancellor for research, maybe that's where it is, um, vice chancellor for innovation. Well, deans do, I was a, a vice president, but I think deans do more work actually, so it might be better to do a de have a, find a dean to do that, but I'm sorry. Go ahead. I served two terms on the faculty senate. I was on the APC for two terms. Uh, I brought these ideas up before, but you're right. If you don't have an administrator who embraces that sort of thing, they just you know, say thank you, that was a great idea, and then it doesn't happen. My, my, um, for, for, for a time, I was head of the career education program for the US Office of Education. That is the external, uh, head of the external task force. And during that time, I argued intensely for the creation of apprenticeships and internships as the tool that would transition from higher education to a job or from high school to a job for the people who didn't do advanced uh, uh, degrees. And uh, the people, I was pushed out of that job. 
I didn't care. I mean, I was I, I put everything I had into it, but I didn't. I, I wasn't abashed when I was removed. But uh, what well, the the lobby that prevented that, and the lobby that I think prevents it in this country, is the counselors' lobby. The counselors give tests that tell people what they can do, and the idea that you only learn what you can do by virtue of experiential uh, hands-on contact with the job, with the job learning context, is um, is a myth that uh, pervades higher education and the schools both, mm -hmm. and I think it's a pernicious one. Um, the second uh, idea having to do with older and younger faculty, I think that's wonderful. Now you you. Uh, talk about our old people being shunted aside, it's not only that, but you find <coughs> large numbers of faculty who are either drug addicted or alcoholics by the time they're about 40 or, or 50 because they haven't, they haven't received the Nobel Prize yet. And uh, <laughs> they, they need to find something that will give their, 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 their lives some, some purpose, some interpersonal interactions that meant something. And I think that would be one thing that might do that. I'm going to address uh, Laura's question about STEM and STEAM, right? Put the A in STEM for the arts. And um, actually, uh, our Vice Chancellor, standing right here next to us, has really been doing a series of, they're not round tables exactly, but meetings where we've been invited. I know he's invited me about eight times, and I haven't been able to make it, because I've been Still working. Time. There's, yeah, I figured there was. Um, <laughs> Um, I've been busy with Centennial College here. Um, but he's been doing quite a bit, actually, to build interdisciplinary teams. Uh, really, out-of-the-box thinking. I have to be very candid about that. So he's bringing together scientists and graphic designers and, and nutrition folks in ways to look at research, because this is where it is in the future. We can no longer be, we have to go back to the Renaissance folks, right? There's so much knowledge now, we have to figure out where are the connections to get us to the next level. So I think we're, do, we're, getting, we're on the road. There's another question over there. Um, or not? No. Any other questions from the audience? Probably have time for one more. Uh. A question, it's more of a comment, but uh, I think Paul just mentioned outside funding sources. I know that internal funding is difficult to find often, but you mentioned Robert Fuller as a, uh, as a quiz on this campus. Well, Bob was a great teacher and he was a great motivator of people here, but he was also a conjurer of, of grants. And some people have that skill. I mean, he used the Exxon Educational Foundation and NSF. And if you can find, there are ideas like that, that people with money would love to fund, but you have to find the you have to find the conduit to get that outside money to bring it in. And once you demonstrate that it's successful, maybe you'll find some uh, local funding as well. But that's, that's something somebody ought to be uh, involved with investigating, pursuing. You all know that. You want to comment on that? Uh, last comment? Maybe? I could just say um, I've been running a self-supporting project for the last 15 years on Native American education. And uh, it was really easy, actually, to raise money. And, but uh, it, wasn't, it was even easier back there in the centennial days because the foundations were interested in improving teaching. They funded thousands of writing across the curriculum projects across the United States. And that's gone. And I found, even with my current funders, um, that they like to do startups, but they don't fund ongoing things, so um, yeah. that is a challenge. But I think you could get help there. You must have a good research department and grants and research that can help coach people and look. It's, an in, it's not difficult to do, even if you're not an expert. NSF is a really good source, but it's got to have some science. We even got some funding from the legislature. Imagine that. <laughs> it's true that you have to find people like Bob Fuller and so on. Who, well, the, the Centennial Project actually was funded initially by a, a grant from the, from the Woods Foundation, um, which 
came sort of after the idea, but at least it was helpful to provide the impetus for the program. Um, but the reason we got money from the legislature was because Doug B. Ryder, who was a, a, a member of the Appropriations Committee, um, his favorite professor at the university was Adam Breckenridge, who at that time was the acting uh, vice chancellor or chancellor. We had a period of time in my time when people asked me when I was vice chancellor, when I was such and such. There was a 10 year period I was in the office. And I was either assistant vice chancellor, acting vice chancellor, chancellor, or whatever, uh, with a, a whole group of other people because we had so much change. But uh, we got that money because uh, Adam Breckenridge uh, persuaded uh, Doug B. Ryder that we needed a special fund. We needed some special funding to improve undergraduate education. And so the B. Ryder Amendment, it was called, was added to the Appropriations Committee of the, of the legislature, and we got some money, and, um, and, and I got to administer it, and, and we got Jim O'Hanlon to come over from Teachers College and figure out how to do it, and the first thing he did is establish the Teaching and Learning Center, which for a long period of time was a very good thing. So, yeah, it takes money. But the money comes from individuals who have either the ability or who know people who can get it funded. I think it comes down to the individual person who can get the job done. Yeah, with that, and I, an administrator who will support it. With that, um, we have time for one last question. Yeah. Yes. You raised a very important question, Elizabeth. How do people deal with fear? And demystifying fear, I think, is, is what we have to teach people about. That is, there, there probably are some fearless people, and I wouldn't trust them very much. <laughs> but learning that Fear need not be paralytic. That most people who do anything that's hard to do, do it in spite of their fear. That, that, that the fear is there and it's real. But any kind of change really depends upon being able to have the bravery to act in spite of the, the fear. So that modeling that and demystifying it, not, not, not uh, granting the illusion that, uh, well, it was easy, I just went ahead and did it, uh, is, is very important, but that's the element that does, does not get communicated. The, all of these people know something about fear uh, and, and yet have acted in spite of it. And, and I think that's terribly important. Parents model that, too. With that, I, I think it's time to wrap this up. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I think we're going to have plenty of time for more. There will be a reception afterwards. Um, so I have to turn the microphone back to Bob. Yeah. Well, this has really certainly uh, generated a lot of different ideas and thoughts. And I know that we're going to have some time for some more discussion uh, after the, the formal program here. So I'll look forward to that. Um, I want to recognize all of the panelists and to thank you uh, for being part of this. I mean, I know that you've been part of the reunion and things that we've been doing uh, through the week. Uh, but in particularly to recognize uh, your work with the panel, we have a special gift for you. Uh, this year we published the Dear Old Nebraska volume and I have one for each. And I think if you look in the front, you'll also see that these are, are signed by Ronnie Green. So uh, Ronnie, Chancellor Green is very pleased that you've been able to be with us for this. And we thank you uh, for being part of the, for our Nebraska lecture series and also uh, the Centennial uh, reunion this week. So let's have a hand for the panel.